There is no tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. We are live inside Korakuen Stadium in Tokyo, Japan, as HBO Sports presents World Championship Boxing. Probably the greatest memories uh, that stand out right now is, you know, the Taylor Chavez fight will forever mm. be one that uh, just blew me away. Uh, the second one probably had to be, uh, I would say, uh, Tyson getting knocked out by Buster Douglas. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we all had plans. I was going to stay in Japan for a couple of days and take a vacation, but my room was right across from Mike's at the new Otani hotel in Japan. And all I heard for four days were people going into that, that room that probably should not have been going in and out of that room. And uh, there's some great pictures that I gave you uh, when he fought Tubbs, when he fought, uh, uh, when he fought uh, Buster. But there's some great shots of all of us gathering around. There was Ray and Ross and Lampley. I think Lampley's first fight, if I'm not mistaken, was in Japan when, when he fought Tubbs. You're right. You're right about yeah. that. That was his first fight. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's not a bad memory for a 70-year-old. Uh, but, 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 but I, but I remember Jim flying into, uh, in, into Japan, staying at the new Otani hotel, uh, earlier that morning, we had had an earthquake. I was like on the 32nd floor, but, uh, but as far as the Buster, uh, Douglas, uh, Tyson, uh, you know, I, I knew something was going to happen. I knew that Mike was not prepared, uh, probably one of the greatest. Uh, fights that will ever be on 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 television um, that night I, I i remember where i was i was in college and uh i was on the track team in college and somebody had an off-campus apartment and they had hbo so there was like like 30 people there and you, you know back then tyson was demolishing most people in a round or two it was an event you you were going to see an event it was like all right let, let's see how mike knocks this guy out and so I'm sitting watching that fight, and I'm the boxing fan, so I'm watching it from beginning to end. People are kind of coming in the room and looking. So first round happens, no, no, no knockout. Second, third round, and Buster's starting to like pile up points. More and more people came into the room. By the time it got to the, I, I, I think it was the eighth round when Mike knocked Buster down. Magnificent. And there's a right hand uppercut, and down goes Douglas. I remember jumping up saying, finally, it's over, and it wasn't over. And Buster got up and proceeded to lay a hellacious beating on Mike Tyson. Shades of Ray Leonard against Tommy Hearns. Douglas coming back for the left and right. Tyson is wobbling. Tyson needs the ropes for support. Douglas wailing away. Rolling willingly just to try to get in the shot that will finish things in his Oh, the head. uppercut. What an uppercut by Douglas, and down goes Tyson. He, he, it's over. It's over. Mike Tyson has been knocked out. Let's go ahead and call it the biggest upset in the history of heavyweight championship fights. Say it now, gentlemen. James Buster Douglas, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. And I just remember... Being so stunned that 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 happened, but you were there in Japan. You spent time with Mike leading up to it, and you said you you weren't shocked by the upset. Was he just again? These are stories that you read about, you see documentaries about, but you you were there. Was that was he so unfocused because he just assumed Buster's quitting fights before? I'm going to knock this guy out. I really don't need to train hard. Was he just out of his mind with arrogance and all the other stuff he had going on in his life? I, 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 I think that that played a certain role. I think Mike was so used to demolishing people so quickly that, uh, that he took it for granted. I think also you had Buster Douglas, who also was on a mission 
yeah. fighting for his mother who had just died recently. Uh, mm -hmm. I also think that we found out something that we weren't really aware of is that Mike was suspect to a good jab, which uh, nobody had uh, really successfully planted on him. And, and, and it kind of threw Mike off his game a little bit. And, and I also think, and, and there will be people that will always mention this until the day that I die, is that knockdown uh, where Mike knocked down Bugless, uh, you know, if you go back and watch it, uh, was it 13 seconds, 14 yeah. seconds, yeah, 15 it seconds? Uh, it, it, it was, uh, it, it was uh, I think the referee was thrown off. I think everybody was so surprised that, uh, uh, you know, he could have very easily have been counting out and everybody would have gone home. But, uh, you know, as the jabs hit more and more and Mike was stretched out to more rounds and he wasn't in the best shape he was, uh, you know, when, you know, the, the greatest, I'm going to say one of the greatest, uh, television shots in boxing will forever be Mark Payton's and, 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 and our, and our handheld cameraman's incredible shot of Mike on his knees, yep. looking lost, trying to find his mouthpiece. Mouth it's, it's over. It's over. Mike Tyson has been knocked out. To yep. put it back in his mouth, and that, and, and that, and that shot will forever remain with me as one of the greatest pieces of television art that I've ever seen. Yes, the and the 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 great, you know, Hall of Fame director Mark Payton, you're right. That shot it li those are the things that live in your mind. Mike just Mike felt how I think a lot of fans they didn't they couldn't believe what they were watching and Mike I'm sure it was all instinct and seeing him fumbling trying to put his mouthpiece in it was a uh, it was some moment, but after the fight, there was so much chaos. You know, they were saying it was a long count, and the boxing organizations at first they weren't giving Buster the title. There was all this crazy stuff going on behind the scenes. Did you have a chance after the fight to spend any time with Mike, or at that point was it just chaos because he was with King and they were trying to get the fight overturned? The the answer is the answer is. Uh, in the in my entire history of producing and being involved as either as a replay director as uh, a, an, a, an AD, a television production truck is controlled chaos. Yep. Uh, there's so many things that are going on at one time. Everybody has a role, and while it's crazy and noisy to somebody who's never been it. It, it, it's very organized. Yeah. This fight was the only time that I will ever remember that the control room, the truck actually became part of the viewing audience. What we were wa witnessing was so surprising to all of us that Ross Greenberg, who was producing the show yeah. at the time, had to remind us and, and uh, you know with a with, with with a scream that only Ross could bellow that we had to get control of ourselves because we had uh momentarily lost focus on our job mm. becoming part of the event that was going on wow. as i mentioned everybody thought that mike was going to win my plans were to stay for another week in Japan and vacation. Uh, at the end of the fight, the control truck was so out of control that what we were doing is we were scrambling with our production administrative team to book flights from Tokyo to New York. ASAP 
because what was going to be an early knockout had now turned into the biggest upset ever in sports. Mm. And we needed to get back ASAP to New York to get ready to replay that show with a studio uh, event. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I, I missed out on my vacation in Japan. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it ended up becoming uh, what will probably be uh, one of the wildest 90 minutes ever in boxing history. And you were, you were, um, directing replays for that fight, right? Yeah. Rick and Rick and I were in the replays. Ross was producing. Mark was directing. Uh, you know, it, 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 I mean, it, it, it was that long ago. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just remember that if you go back and watch that fight, it's, it's just, so beautifully put together and directed really by yep. Mark and, and by Ross and and Rick and I were on our A game with our uh, with our technicians in the replay room and uh, and wow I mean to have four or five replay I mean it it was just uh, you know replay after replay after replay and uh, you know from the knockdown to him on the ground to looking for the mouthpiece. The, the, it was just a a potpourri of incredible uh, individual sports moments that can be broken down into little stories individually. Uh, no, I never spoke to I, Mike. I never spoke to you know. I never spoke to the Buster. Uh, my our job was to to pack up our bags. And the amazing yeah. job, yeah, the amazing job was how quickly they got uh, 20 of us on a flight a.m. the next morning back to New York. And uh, I remember it, we worked about 24 hours getting that show ready for the rebroadcast. Yeah, because I, um, I remember the rebroadcast, Tyson had his shades on. And and, and and Buster was there. You know what? I, I have to give you guys credit too, you and Rick and Tate, because I remember watching that fight. And as it became apparent that something special was happening, that this could be an upset, you guys rolled in some footage that you probably didn't think you would need or were going to use. There was sparring footage of Tyson getting knocked down by Greg Page, former yep. heavyweight champion Greg Page. Yep. And you guys put that in there. And it just showed that. You know, this might not be an accident what we're seeing happening in this ring. Tyson, you know, fighters get dropped, but he got dropped by Greg Page in, in training. Um, and you guys got that in there. And it was just another part of the story that we were watching. So I remember seeing that and thinking, oh, wow, He's, this might not be a fluke. I mean, he might lose this fight. And sure enough, he did. And you talk about... um. Uh, the 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 flight to New York and the show you guys did in New York, um, Tyson's mood seemed well. Without talking about that, when you were in New York and Mike was in New York, at that point was there really no access to him? Did you have a chance to talk to him at all, or, or was no, he just no, all business? No, he he. I, I think from that moment he went into uh, witness protection behind <laughs> Don behind Don King at that point. Right. Uh, I, I remember having a lot of conversations with Don, uh, but Don was pretty much trying to do his best uh, to get that fight overturned by the yeah. long count. And, yeah. and that was, that was, uh, you know, that was Don's mission. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I would say probably after that, uh, Mike and I didn't spend much time together, uh, ever again. And, and, uh, and the, and at that point, I think the heavyweight belt just got kind of passed around, uh, from one to another. And, and I think, and you would know this better than I, I, I don't think anybody reigned supreme, uh, very long after that. No, no, you're right. It was, uh, you know, Mike had unified it at that point, and then it, it became fractured, and then you're right. It became this guy had a belt, then this guy had a belt, and then Riddick Bowe was supposed to be the man, and then he wasn't, and 
Uh, it wasn't quite like those moments when Mike Mike Tyson was announced the undefeated, undisputed heavyweight champion. It was um, it was a different time. But Mike, my head is sp- like all these fighters that you got to spend time with. Like you even brought up Pinklin Thomas, and and I remember if people don't remember Pinklin Thomas, he's a former heavyweight champion. Uh, he had some drug issues back then, and and he ended up fighting Mike Tyson at one point. And he didn't do a bad job, but he got he, he won some rounds on his jab. But what kind of a w- – was he another guy that you got to spend time with and get to know well, Pinklin Thomas? I, I, Pinklin, was, Pinklin was a really good guy. I, I didn't get a chance to, to spend much time with him. I, I, I think that, you know, a, after Ray left, after Tyson left, after Holmes left, after Camacho left, uh, the, the, you know, I, 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 I knew Meldrick Taylor fairly well, uh, you know, that Lou Duva camp of, of Meldrick and Purnell, uh, yep. you know, we, we were pretty, uh, we, we were pretty good friends with the Duvas and, and I, and I had a good friendship with, with, with Dan up until his death and, and to, to all the Duva family. So, uh, but you know, Evander was a good guy. Bo was a, you know, Bo, Bo was the hardest guy to work with of any fighter that I've ever had to deal with only Why? because he, he just never showed up on time. Uh, uh, you, uh, you know, you know, w- when you go to do these stories, uh, you try to format what the, the crux of the story is, mm-hmm. although you have to be flexible and it just in case something, uh, comes along that you're not expecting. Uh, but everything is laid out hour by hour after after hour, and uh, man, he just never showed up on time. He he was just very very difficult, and when he would show up, there'd just be thousands of people with him. So it was very challenging. Uh, Evander, another guy, good guy, but uh, you know it start kind of started the new generation of fighters that. Uh, kind of didn't have the laissez-faire relationship with the production as mm. in, in the earlier days. Um, right. You know, and, and, and that's kind of, I mean, Oscar De La Hoya the same way. Uh, you know, Oscar was protected by his own people and yep. wanted to do his own thing and, uh, and, and did a very good job at it. But, uh, uh, but but yeah, a, a, after Mildrick and after uh, you know the Chavez and after uh, uh, who was the other Sp- the great fan uh, Julio Chavez and who was the other guy that fought uh, Chavez? No, nah, it was it, it was the other Mexican fighter. The um, oh it'll, god, I, it, it, it'll it'll come it'll come to me. Just, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah, give it a yeah. minute. It'll come to us. Yeah, there was another great uh, Jose Luis Ramirez. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but, a- but after, you know, a- after those years, after 92, uh, it became more of a business. And I yeah. think a lot of that had to do of the way HBO treated the events. Uh, we made those pay-per-views, the TV KO, they became a little bit more businesslike. Um, and-, and I think that we, we spent less time uh, hanging around with the fighters as we did in the earlier days. That's what I loved when, and still to this day, that that's why I became a producer. I always loved boxing, but I always loved the stories that you guys did, the features, we call them features, that 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 you guys did so well. Uh, and um, Meldrick Taylor, you, you brought up Meldrick Taylor. Meldrick, who w- was phenomenally talented. I mean, he he was a special fighter, and you bring up the Chavez fight that he, you know, was within seconds of winning. Um, his life has turned into a, a, a tragedy. He's still alive, but I don't. I hear he's not doing so well. But a, a young Meldrick Taylor, what what was he like back then? I I I think many thought that he could be uh, the next Sugar Ray Leonard if treated yeah. properly. I think his yeah. I think his skills were incredible. His hand speed. His strength. Uh, he had a good team behind him. I think, uh, you know, I think on two separate nights, uh, two trainers uh, 
screwed up with their fighters. Uh, the first one being Pat and, and Goody Petronelli. Mm. Uh, when, when Marvin fought uh, uh, a Ray, uh, yep. you know, Ray got into Marvin's head so badly that Marvin was nothing but a puncher that, you know, Marvin, you know, was out to show Sugar Ray Leonard that he could box. And I think because of that, I believe uh, that he gave away the, those first three rounds. Uh, if, I, if it would have been me uh, with Ray's rust and layoff, I, if I was Marvin, I would have gone out there in the first couple of seconds, uh, similar to Hearns yes. uh, Hagler, and yes. tried to knock him out and see, yes. you know, you know, I'm, I'm going to put you uh, in a real fight. Let's see if you're ready. But, but, but the Petronellis uh, encouraged Marvin to let Ray become comfortable. And once he did, uh, then that fight was up for, for grabs. And the second one was Lou Duva absolutely uh, making the huge mistake with Meldrick of not, you know, I, I think on the scorecards, I, I think Meldrick was ahead. All he needed to do was stay away from the right hand of, of Chavez, and, and, and he didn't do it. So uh, two of the biggest mistakes ever by trainers in boxing history. Sugar Ray Leonard, I'm, and I'm trying to respect your time here. And I don't want to, by the way, I want to do this I got, more than once. I got as much time as you need, so it doesn't matter. But well, I also want to do this more than once. I didn't, I didn't yeah. want this to be a one-shot thing, but Leonard and Hagler. HBO Sports presents World Championship Boxing. As marvelous Marvin Hagler defends his middleweight title against Sugar Ray Leonard. Once every couple of years, there are events in boxing which capture the public's imagination. Arenas, theaters, and stadiums around the world are packed with paying customers with all eyes on an outdoor arena here in Las Vegas. It's estimated 350 million people worldwide will see this fight. Your friend, is it, it's safe to say, this is 1987, you're friends with Sugar Ray Leonard at this time, right? You, you guys are friends. The answer is yes. Uh, Ray was training in, uh, it, it was either Hilton Head or Myrtle Beach. I'm not sure which one it was. I think it, it was. was Hilton Head, I think. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure which one it was, but I, I was, uh, I was doing the, I was doing the Ray feature. Uh, it was the first time that, uh, it was difficult getting the access to Ray like I had. Um, you know, it was it was not fun. It was completely business. Uh, Ray's handlers that I knew very, very well uh, just really protected Ray uh, from doing any more than he had to do. So I knew that Ray was getting prepared for this fight. Uh, and, you know, from there I would go, I went down to Palm Springs where Hagler was training. And, you know, it was just the opposite. Hagler was a little bit more uh, open. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember him wearing uh, the hat uh, that, that said destruct and destroy or on my mind. And I, I just remember, how in the hell can I steal this hat and keep this hat? Because it's going be, to be worth something one day. But there's a great shot. I think Rick and I went down there together with both of us sitting with Marvin on the ring. And watching Marvin train, uh, damn, he was just, he he was fast. He was so strong. He was so focused. Mm. Um, and uh, like I said, I I, I blame I blame uh, the Petronellis into changing the game plan of, of Marvin. It, it just, I I think I think he could have knocked Ray out in three rounds. Yeah. I, I know that a million people will disagree with me, but, uh, you know, why not give it your best shot the same way you attacked uh, Tommy Hearns? The best three rounds of boxing uh, that I ever remember in, in, uh, in the beginning. You just keep mentioning these historic moments. but but Well, but I, I just remember Barry Tompkins going absolutely, I mean, it, it was the most exciting thing that we had ever seen. Hearns working that jab. He has a very quick jab. There's no denying it. And he caught Hagler with two good jabs and a right hand that might have hurt Hagler. Tremendous pace in the first round. I expect this, Barry. Both guys are going at it. Hearns getting the better of it right now. You know, both 
guys just being shot. So whip this corner chin with Darren Michael down. Left hand by Hagler that stood through straight up. And a right hand. Both men have felt the wrath of the other. Tommy is hurt. Hagler punishing Hearns now. But it is Hagler who is bleeding. This is still the first round. Oh, yeah. It was, it was absolutely yeah. incredible. You know, early day. I think it was the early days of punch that uh, where I, I don't know where the, where Kenobio and Hobson probably got carpal tunnel syndrome hitting that uh, punches and connects, but that yeah, that was just absolutely, uh, damn that was that that was just great boxing. Well, I want to ask the reason why I asked you about Sugar Ray Leonard and you guys being friends. Um, when when this was really happening, and you're you're going to cover, you know, going to do features on on the guys. Did you think that that your friend Ray Leonard had a shot at that time to beat Marvelous Marvin Hagler? Did you think he stood a chance in that fight? No. No. Would he would he talk to you guys about this? Because Larry Merchant was open. Larry picked Marvin Hagler and on on the air, and he said, you know, years ago Sugar Ray Leonard was as complete a fighter as I'd ever seen. But with the inactivity and Marvin so good and big. He picked Marvin. So did you ever, I imagine you said it was all business at that point. So you never, it would be hard to have that conversation anyway. Like, did he ever ask you like, hey, man, Mike, do you think I can beat this guy? Did, did no. that ever happen? Okay. No, I I, I, I was never consulted for my opinion. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I, 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 I know I, I, I've said this a couple of times, but, uh, you know, I thought, and, and I was ready for this, I thought that it was going to be uh, Hagler Hearns too. I, mm -hmm. I really thought that that's how the first three couple rounds were going to play out, is that Marvin was just going to try to bust him. Um, and uh, Ray had been so inactive. I think he had had I mean, did, did, didn't he have one comeback? Uh, he did, Kevin Howard. He Kevin came Howard, once, yeah. Got knocked down and then retired again. Yeah, uh, but but I, I just thought that, that, that Marvin was probably about as sharp as he could have been, um, and, 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 and I was wrong. And like I said, I, I just think that Ray uh, was not just one of the greatest of all times, but he could get into somebody's head Unlike and, and he got into he got into Marvin's head so badly that he was nothing but a brawler, and that you know Ray was going to give him a boxing lesson, and I think Marvin was so determined to show the world that despite being a a you know a middleweight Mike Tyson of sorts, mm -hmm. that he was also fabulous as a fighter and. Uh, it was a, it, it was shocking the way it played out. Hagler Hearns, you you brought that up. Were you, um, were you working that fight live? Were you in tape yeah. of that fight? You yep. were. Yeah, Rick, Rick, and I once again. It's okay. So you you can you you talked about the tape room as as what it is. It's controlled chaos. It gets loud, but there's always an order. That fight, the way that you rarely see. Fights on that level live up to the hype. You, you, it doesn't often happen, and it sure doesn't happen like that, where the guys just come out and they go to war like those guys did. So, what was it like for you and Rick and Tape? Because the first few seconds, I mean, Tommy Hagler came out strong. Tommy hit him with a right, and it was on. So, what was it like for you guys watching that? Well, it was just trying to to methodically. Uh, keep an order to to try to show the replays of a fight that had so many punches uh, of where do you go? I mean, normally in a fight, uh, there's there, there's a set of punch, there's a body shot, uh, right. and, and then the knockout comes. So, but in this particular case. There's four replay. Back in those days, there was four replay machines. So you always had four angles. You had the angle from up top, which showed the whole ring, which was mm -hmm. usually waist up. You had two handheld cameras, and then you always had an overhead. 
So you always had the ability of showing four replays for anything possible. Right. But Rick and I were not go doing four replays. We were showing eight, 12 replay sequences. And uh, it, 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 it was a little bit exhausting and taxing. I, I think Rick and I were probably as tired as, <laughs> as Hearns and, ha and Hagler were uh, right. just trying to organize that. Because you got to remember, I mean, you, you you got one, you got a one minute round, which goes uh, fast. You, it get, goes fast. You got you got you know you, you're 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 sending back machines before the round's over uh, to replay. Uh, you've done it before. You know how it is. Uh, you know, and when you have twenty or thirty fights that connected uh, between the two guys per round. Uh, you, you really needed a four minute break between rounds to show everybody. Right. And, right. and we didn't have that. Uh, you know, it, I, I'm amazed that it only went three rounds. I thought it would go more than that. Uh, but, uh, but, but I know Hearns, I was, I was there at the crunk gym when he was getting ready up there. I think it was, uh, was he with Eddie Futch and, and some of those guys? Back in those days, I'm not sure who well, Hearns guy was, was trained by Emmanuel Stewart. Uh, Emmanuel Stewart. Yep. Emmanuel Stewart. Yep. yep. Yeah. Emmanuel Stewart, uh, who ended up coming over to HBO as an analyst for a yeah, while. Yep. But uh, but I remember going up to the Kronk gym and uh, you know watching him and James Tony was up there and uh, and and he just uh, Hearns just looked like he was in great shape. He was ready. Marvin was ready, but. Uh, you know, to this day, I don't think Barry or any of us would ever think that it would just be uh, uh, the nine minutes of boxing that 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 the world saw on that particular night. And I don't think yeah. uh, maybe outside of the Gotti Ward fights, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you would know better than I would. Uh, I don't know if there was any more two or three rounds consecutively that had as much action a a as that particular fight did. And I don't know if if even those fights uh, for nine minutes were as uh, intense as that particular fight was. No, especially when when you you take into account who Hagler and Hearns were, two of the best fighters in the world. And no disrespect to Arturo and Mickey, the late great Arturo Gatti, they they weren't on that championship caliber level. Where I mean, these are you're talking about legendary fighters and and Hagler and Hearns. So that's why I said it's. It's rare when you see a, a fight of that magnitude happen the way it did. But you brought up the Kronk Gym, the famous Kronk Gym in Detroit. Um, that's another place that I never went to. I've, I've only read the stories about how it was 95 degrees in there and it was piping hot in this basement. Um, talk about the Kronk Gym. What was it like being there? Describe the atmosphere in there. Well, it was it, it, it was a it, it was a, a smelly sweat hole uh, <laughs> that uh, you have to be a fighter to want to hang out in there. You're, you're right. It was it was 85, 90 degrees, and uh, uh, you know it, it was uh, it it was uh, you know if, if you were going to uh, create for a movie, uh, you know a, a stereotypical gym. Uh, you needed to look no further uh, than up in Detroit. That it, it, it was it was incredible. It was it was a fabulous place. Uh, but but yeah, I mean Eddie Futch and you got Emmanuel Stewart. Uh, and uh, who ended up being uh, who ended up being who was ended up being Tony's manager? The woman. Oh, Jackie Callan. Jackie Callan. He was was always a figure up there. Uh, but uh, what, what I loved about it is that whenever HBO arrived in town, uh, we were we were welcomed with open arms. Uh, all of these fighters knew at the time that that uh, that this was this this was this was uh, this this was going to be a big event. This yeah. was going to be something that people were going to mark on their calendars. This was going to be a thing that people that never followed boxing were going to watch. Uh, there was going to be, uh, you know, we, it was amazing the amount of, uh, of females who we got interested in the game of boxing. Uh, 
because of the Ray Leonard's, of the Marvin Hagler's, of the Hector Macho Camacho's. Um, it became a, a, just a tremendous event that when you walked into uh, Las Vegas, the MGM Caesars, I mean, Caesars Palace uh, on, on a big fight, uh, the, 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 you know, the most well-known hotel in the world just rocked with excitement like it was the Rolling Stones performing. It was it was just absolutely incredible.